everybody, this is David Pike, the Motor City Mechanic. In today's video, we're going to be talking about removing and replacing the alternator on a 2005 all the way up to 2009 Ford Mustang with a 4.6 liter V8 engine. Obviously, we're going to talk about the steps related to the alternator, but we're also going to talk about the serpentine belt as far as removing and replacing that as well due to the number of miles it has. Also, we're going to be dealing with the throttle body, and I'm going to show you how to clean it both on and off the vehicle. So basically, you're getting a three for one special. Now, if you don't own a Mustang, still make sure to watch the video because there's going to be a lot of tips and tricks that you can use on other vehicles as well. This particular Mustang is a 2007 and it has 83,000 miles. So based off of that, and the fact that we're removing and replacing the alternator, it just makes sense to go ahead and replace the serpentine belt at the same time. And also as far as the throttle body, it's recommended around every 30,000 miles to clean the throttle body. So while it's off, we'll go ahead and tackle that as well. So that way we're taking on multiple items at the same time. They're coming off, so why not go ahead and replace or clean them? So for the first step, let's go ahead and talk about replacing and taking off that serpentine belt. Now in order to get more access to the belt so we can see how it's routed and to get to the tensioner, what we're going to be doing is removing the rubber inlet that goes from the upper air filter housing to the throttle body assembly. Now we don't have to deal with the upper housing, we only need to remove this section from here to here and I'll show you a couple things. It's clamped in place with an 8mm radiator hose type clamp here and at the throttle body and we've also got a plastic hose we got to disconnect over here. Now you can use either an 8 millimeter socket on the cordless tool or you can use a flat tip screwdriver. Either one will work. In this case we're going to use the cordless tool because we got one that makes things a lot easier. So it's one clamp we had to take loose. Let's work on the other one. So just repeat the same procedure. Back it off a few times. You ain't got to take it all the way loose. You just want to get enough slack so you can actually slide it off the throttle body. Now we're going to move over to this plastic T right here that has a hose that leads over to the valve cover. I'm going to point out something on this particular vehicle that you may come across. Now the hose has two plastic disconnects, both on each end. They're green in color. If you look right here about halfway down the length of it, you'll see a section of rubber hose. And typically there will not be rubber hose here. In the past, someone has broke this more than likely from trying to take it off or not taking it off and remove that rubber intake and then it broke. And then what they did to fix it was to put a section of rubber hose, which is fine. If you look real close, you'll see that that section of rubber hose is starting to get cracks. So what we're going to do before we go back with it is to cut another piece about the same length and the same diameter, remove this one and slide the new piece over. Now if this had any kind of pressure on it, I definitely wouldn't be doing this type of repair. I'd replace the plastic pipe. But being that this is going from the valve cover to the air inlet, we don't have to worry about that. We just want to make sure that there's no leak. So another section of rubber hose will be fine. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and remove that plastic section of hose from the rubber inlet. Now the release for the quick connect is underneath, but being that I'm going to be taking this off to replace that rubber section, I can show you better off the vehicle how it releases. And then the quick connect on the other end of that plastic pipe is exactly the same. Now with it off the vehicle, I can show you a little bit better about how it works. Now to release that green piece that actually locks onto the nipple, you have to reach around until you feel a piece that sticks out, this arm right here. Now when I push it this way, as you can see, it spreads it apart. That releases it off the nipple so that I can slide it off. And that's how you release it. You might not be able to see it, but you'll be able to feel this raised portion right here. Much like it was on the intake like this, I can reach up under, I can spread it apart, and slide it off. And that's how that releases. So now that we got both the clamps taken off and we got that plastic disconnect release, we can go ahead and start wiggling on the air inlet, get it off the throttle body, and then get it off the air box. Just pick up, sit to the side. Now the two big differences on replacing the serpentine belt on different makes and models is how is the belt routed? It's always going to be different. And it doesn't matter if it's the same kind of vehicle because on a Ram diesel you might have two alternators. On a Hemi, you might have an electric power steering setup and you don't have a power steering pump while others do. So every make and model is going to be slightly different. 
And the other thing is, how is this serpentine belt tensioner released? Now, the main thing we're going to be dealing with right this second is, how is the belt routed? And there's a couple key things that you can do to actually keep track of that so when you go back with the belt, you don't have any issues. Now, one of the easiest things you can do is actually grab your camera and take pictures of the belt how it's routed on each one of the pulleys and kind of work your way around. Because more than likely, you might not be able to take one picture that captures everything. So just kind of find some of the key pulleys, take a quick picture, follow it around, snap some more shots, until you feel like you've got everything captured on that camera. And the other thing is you can grab a pen and a piece of paper, and you can actually draw circles for different pulleys and draw you a diagram of the belt. Now, like I mentioned, another option is grab a piece of paper and a pen and start sketching what everything is and where they're located. Make abbreviations, draw lines, whatever you gotta do. Do whatever's best for you, what's gonna work. For me, might not work for you, but kinda get everything laid out the way it needs to be. Sketch everything, make sure you got it drawn correctly. So you've got options. You can take a picture, you can draw a picture, or you can go online and find a picture. Sometimes the belts will come with the diagram on the belt. I've seen that on late model vehicles, brand new on the lot. Other things I've seen is the wrap that the belt comes on from the manufacturer when you go to the parts store actually might have the diagram on it as well. But just to be sure, double check what your vehicle has because it may be a misprint or maybe they gave you the wrong part, something to that effect. Just double check what you got on the vehicle and line it up to that. Now in order to get the serpentine belt off, we've got to release the tension on the belt. Now in order to do that, we've got to get to the tensioner. Now it's over here on the passenger side of the engine. Now one thing you can do to get more access is to unbolt this coolant pressure tank. Now we don't have to worry about draining coolant. All we're going to do is unbolt it and sit it to the side. We're not taking any hoses loose and we're not taking the cap off. Now the tank is bolted to the shroud of the radiator fan assembly with two 8 millimeter bolts. All we got to do is pick up straight in the overflow hose. It is actually sitting in the top edge of the radiator. Just kind of pick it up as you go. We've got enough slack in both of the hoses to sit it up and out of the way. Now, if that pressure tank removed, we've got access to the serpentine belt tensioner. It mounts on this side right here, pivots from this location, and on the opposite end that's got the pulley, that's where we're going to be releasing it. This one actually has a square cutout in the end of it. In that case, we can use anything that's half inch drive, whether it's a serpentine belt that has a half inch drive on the end of it or a ratchet or breaker bar. So it's fairly simple and doesn't need a lot of special tools. Now, like I mentioned, you could use a half inch drive breaker bar or ratchet to release the tension. But what I like to do is get as much leverage as possible. Now, this is your typical serpentine belt tool. They come in different shapes, sizes with different attachments, possibly different sockets. The end of this is 3 8 drive. We already know that the hole in the end of the tensioner is half inch. So all I'm doing is getting a step up that goes from 3 8 to half inch. And then with this, I've got all the leverage I need for releasing the spring tension on the tensioner. So at this point, grab whatever tool you're gonna to be using, get it inserted into the end of the tensioner, and you're gonna turn clockwise. As you turn clockwise, you're gonna see it, you're gonna get some movement of the tensioner and then the belt's gonna get slack in different places. Release the tension, grab your belt, usually take it off the smooth pulleys because that's the easiest, and then work it around all the other pulleys. Once you get it off enough, you can go ahead and release the tension on the tensioner and then work on getting the belts off of everything else. Now when it comes time to get the belt off the serpentine belt tensioner, you're gonna do something a little bit different. Of the other pulleys, all you did was just slide the belt up and off. Of course, the tensioner is blocking a portion of the belt, so we can't pull it towards the front. Instead, we've got to go on the back side of the pulley. But luckily, there's enough room to get it around. Some vehicles, you have to unbolt the tensioner so you've got room. But in this case, we do have enough access to turn the belt on its side. Just take your time and work it around. And 
here we have it. Now with the serpentine built off, now we can actually move on to the throttle body. Now like I mentioned, every 30,000 miles it's recommended to go ahead and clean it. So I want to show you step by step what we need to do. Now logically of course being that it's something electrical, the first step is to always disconnect the battery. So let's go ahead and jump over to that. Now the first step I recommend is to find where your battery is located and disconnect the negative cable. That way you don't have any issues because we're also going to be dealing with the alternator so it's going to come off for that. Also for cleaning the throttle body, it's a good practice to go ahead and disconnect it so when you reinstall it, everything can go through its self calibration and that way the clean throttle body will get recognized and you won't have any problems. So in this particular vehicle being a Mustang, it's an eight millimeter nut. Some vehicles are gonna be 13 or 10 millimeter. It just really depends on the vehicle that you have. Let's take it loose. And then position it out of the way so it doesn't make contact with that post. Now the main items you're gonna need for cleaning that throttle body is some throttle body cleaner. This is from CRC. It's one of the more common brands that you'll find at the local parts store. You're also gonna need a rag. You're gonna need an old toothbrush. There's plenty of them laying around. If you don't have one, it's probably time to replace your old one to begin with. So go ahead and buy you a new one, throw it in your drawer in your bathroom, and grab the one you've been using. From that point forward, we're using it for cleaning the throttle body. Now there's a warning I wanna give you about using throttle body cleaner, and it doesn't have to be any particular brand. I'm not talking about the cleaner itself, but I'm talking about the means that we're going to be using it, basically spraying it into the intake. So if you take the protective cap off, you've got a nozzle here. You could spray it just this way. There's no problem there. It gives a wide pattern. It'll clean a lot. A lot of people like to use the tube or nozzle that comes with it. You get a more high pressure stream. You can control it a little bit better. But if you decide to use this, don't make the mistake that I have. Because in the past, there's been two times that I did not insert this all the way in like I thought it was. And when I went to spray it, the nozzle came off and went inside the intake of the vehicle. Both times, I wasn't lucky enough to get to it, so the intake had to come off. So I made a lot more work for myself because I wasn't paying attention. So if you decide to use the straw here, make sure that you insert it all the way onto the nozzle. And that it's fully seated. That way it doesn't come off when you're using it. So in order to clean the throttle body, we've got to open these throttle plates up. Which brings me to my next point. There are two different throttle bodies out there. There are the older cable driven, that has the cable going directly to the throttle pedal or gas pedal inside. And then there's the electronically controlled like these. On the cable driven, you can grab the linkage on the outside, rotate it, hold it in position while you're cleaning the plate and the bore. Now on these electronic versions, you're going to have to do it manually. Simple procedure would be just to push on one side of the throttle plate, let it open up, and keep it propped with one hand. Then we can grab the cleaner. We can spray inside the bore and on the plate. We'll let off a little bit so we can get both sides. And then we'll grab our old toothbrush and start scrubbing. Now one thing you might want to do, depending on how much cleaner is dripping out, is to get you a rag and put directly below there. Just scrub the bore. And then also rotate it around and clean the plate both sides. You're probably going to, have to repeat this a few times until you get it nice and clean. It doesn't take a lot of spray of the cleaner, just enough to coat it. You're not going to be using the whole can. Once you think you've got enough, get a little final rinse. Then we can grab the rag, reach up in there and clean it and dry it off. Now, not all vehicles have two throttle plates like this Mustang. Some vehicles only have one. Now, if we we're going to continue cleaning this on the vehicle, we'd have to do the same procedure to the opposite side. We'd open up one side, prop it open, spray it, brush it, dry it, and repeat. Now, being that I want to show you off the vehicle, I'm going to go ahead and leave this side dirty, and then we'll work on actually removing the throttle body, putting it on the bench, and cleaning it that way. Now in order to get to all the fasteners on the front of this 4.6 liter, I need to remove this plastic decorative cover. Now not all Mustangs came with this. This is an add-on option that you could purchase. It's basically just dressed up the engine. So I need to pick up on the corners, release the back of it, 
and then slide it off the front of these studs. Now the starter body has two connectors we gotta release. And both of these connectors have two stage locks, meaning there's a portion you gotta slide first before you can actually squeeze in on the unlock or the release mechanism. Now the first stage is the red portion. What you gotta do on this one is actually grab something like a flat tip screwdriver and pry outward. Once it's fully released at that point, you can squeeze in on the connector and slide it off. And we gotta repeat the same procedure on the opposite side. Now the connector on here is a different style, but the procedure is exactly the same. We've got to slide the red piece away from the front of the connector using whatever you've got. Don't use too much force because you don't want to break it. And then you can squeeze in on the side or the body of the connector, release it, and slide it off. Now this throttle body on the 4.6 liter is attached with four bolts and they're not all the same size. The two uppers here are eight millimeters and we've got two more directly below them that are 10 millimeters. So we'll work on backing those off. Now your vehicle may be different. They may be 10 millimeters, they may be torques. It really depends on the vehicle. So just see what you got. Typically there's a total of four. That's the most common setup that I've seen. So right now we're gonna grab our 10 millimeter sockets Back off on the two nuts on the bottom. Try not to lose them. And we'll switch over to a two eight millimeters. Now when you do that last one, support the throttle body so you don't drop it. Because there won't be nothing else holding it on. It might take a little bit of movement to break it loose. And there is that rubber seal that I was telling you about earlier that you more than likely will have to replace. Now with the throttle body off, you can see that we clean this side right here. The bore is nice and clean. Now of course we've got the little soot mark around this side. This side we haven't touched on yet. And what we do is we're going to manually open this like we did before. And it doesn't matter if you're cleaning it from the back side or the front side, it's the same procedure, whatever's easiest to get to. So I can go ahead and prop this side open, spray some of that cleaner, get it down inside the bore, and grab that same toothbrush, and go up in there and continue scrubbing all the way around, like I said, the bore and the plate. Just repeat it a few times until you see a nice clean area. If you need to, follow it up with the rag. And only use enough to clean. Like I mentioned before, we're not using the entire bottle because we have it. We don't need cleaner getting in places we don't want it. It's a gentle cleaning. A few sprays, some scrubs, and wiping it down. So at that point, we've got both of the bores clean as well as the throttle plates on the throttle body. Both the inside and outside openings are nice and clean. Now it's ready to be put back on the vehicle. Now one thing I always do when I'm working on engines is, if I've opened anything up, such as removed the throttle body or I removed the intake, I like to put something in the openings. I don't want anything getting in there while I'm working. You don't want washers, nuts, debris, anything getting up in there so it doesn't fall into the cylinder head once the valve's open. So for now, put that there, but always remember, make sure you take it out. That's the last thing you wanna do is leave these in here, put the throttle body on there. Now you got a whole new world of problems. But for now, that's what we're gonna to use to block everything off and protect it. Now the alternator is bolted to the lower portion of the block with two 13 millimeter bolts riding on studs. Now up here we've got a bracket that helps suspend it and support it there. Those are held in place with two 10 millimeter bolts on the side and then the alternator is bolted on with two 8 millimeter bolts there. We also got a wiring harness that clicks on in this area. So those are things we're going to be dealing with. We'll work on getting the two 10 millimeter bolts off first, move on to the two 13 millimeter nuts and take this wiring harness loose from the bracket. So now we're ready to start unbolting the alternator from the engine. We're going to be dealing with the two 13 millimeter nuts right there. So 
So then grab whatever tool you're going to be using, be it a socket, extension, hand ratchet, or cordless tool, and take these two 10 millimeter bolts off. Now one thing you're going to find out, that the bolt here on the driver's side is longer than the one on the passenger side. So remember that when you're going back with them. Now from time to time when you're working on vehicles, you're going to be dealing with harnesses that are in the way. Now this harness attaches to the bracket that's going to be coming off with the alternator. And it uses basically a Christmas tree style plastic fastener. And it gets its name basically from the shape and the ribs that are angled as they go through, they grab on. So you gotta use a little bit of force to take them off, but yet you can push them through easily. Now one tool that works great are tools like this. There are some metal trim sticks that work pretty good, but these are designed mainly for removing fasteners like this. From time to time, they're gonna dry out. They may break. But what you want to do is insert it on the side that the wiring harness is and you want to kind of wedge it and pry gently to try to pull it through the bracket. Like I said, from time to time they will break depending on how dry rotted they are, so have no fears. But if you can, try to save them. So now we've got the harness off the bracket. Now we can work at pulling the alternator forward so we can get to the harness on the back side. So at this point, grab two hands and support the alternator. It's got a little bit of weight to it. It's currently sitting on the studs on the bottom that those two 13 millimeter nuts went on. What we're gonna do is we're gonna slide it forward. Might even have to reposition radiator hose. Pick it up and pull it out of the hole that it sits in. And now what we're gonna be dealing with is the main connector from the battery and also the electrical connector here as well. Now the main reason why you've got to disconnect the negative battery cable from the battery is because at the back of the alternator we've got a cable coming directly from the battery that's got 12 volts on it. There's always a chance that this is going to touch something we don't want. And if it does, it's going to short out. Problem is there's no fuse on this circuit. So it's going to continue to short out until something happens to the battery and damages something on the vehicle. Currently there's a rubber boot in the way, so all we've got to do is squeeze on it and pick it up. You're going to find that there is a 10 millimeter nut mounted to a stud and that's what attaches the positive cable to the back of the alternator. Now one thing I don't like doing is using an impact to take it off or installing the nut because when you go back with it there's a chance you could snap what's inside if you turn it too hard. So I want to do it by hand. What you got to do is get it broke loose. Typically you can grab the socket from that point and back it off. Now we can grab the cable, and once again, making sure that, that negative cable has not made contact with the battery. If it's still disconnected, then we'll be good to set it off to the side a little bit. Now the last thing we've got to disconnect from the back of the alternator is this main connector. Now unlike the two connectors that I showed you previously on the throttle body, there is no secondary lock. So all we've got to do is squeeze in on the body and lift up. Now it may be a little difficult, you should hopefully be able to squeeze it by hand. If not, you can grab that flat tip screwdriver and press in as well. So squeeze as hard as you can, and then try to slide it off, and there you have it. So if everything removed, we can now pick up on the alternator in that bracket and put it on the bench. So now we can go ahead and sit the old alternator next to the new alternator. Now this is a Motocraft rebuilt alternator. This is not from their value line. This is a better quality. Now one thing I do not like using is aftermarket alternators. I do not trust them. I don't care if they have a lifetime warranty or not or say that they are new. I've had too many issues with replacing them and then a year later I have to replace them again. So whenever possible, use the manufacturer replacement. If it's Chrysler, go with the Mopar. If it's a Ford, go with the Motocraft. Now, like I said, Motorcraft has different lines of replacement or rebuilt alternators. I've been told to stay away from their value line and spend a little bit more and get their regular Motorcraft rebuilt. That's what this is. So what we're going to do next is transfer the bracket from this one to the new one. Now like I mentioned before, the brackets attach to the alternator with two 8mm bolts. And both of those are the same length, so you don't have to worry about switching them up. Now we can grab the replacement, put the bracket on top, line everything up, and start the two 8mm bolts by hand. Make sure they thread in well. We can grab whatever tools we're using again to tighten them down.
Now we're ready to take it back over to the vehicle, hook up the two connectors, and get ready to sit this back in the hole that it came out of. So now we can grab the alternator, put it back over here. So then we can start dealing with everything we need to plug in and bolt onto the back side of the alternator. So let's grab that one connector, slide it on, and press down until you hear an audible click. Now you know that's fully seated. We can grab that positive cable, get the eyelet. And the way that red portion is on the alternator, we can only put the eyelet on one way. So that way it's not rotated out of position when we go to try to install it on the vehicle. And we can grab the nut, put it on, start running it down by hand. And then we'll follow it up with the ratchet. Like I said, I don't like to use any kind of power tools, cordless tools, air tools, anything for this procedure. And just snug it down. Now we're going to insert that rubber boot back over the end so that way that, that stud doesn't make any kind of contact with anything metal and try to short out. Now we're ready to grab the alternator and sit it back down in the hole. Remember these studs right here is what the alternator is going to sit on. Just go ahead and grab both hands. Work it down in there. Take your time. Make sure the harness is routed properly. And then watch your studs. Make sure everything's lining up as you go back with it. Now what I want to do is go ahead and start all the fasteners by hand. That includes the two 13 millimeter that's going along the bottom and the two 10 millimeter bolts along the top. Now remember, the longer one goes on the driver's side, shorter one on the passenger side. Now the two fasteners that I want to start with tightening first are going to be the two 13 millimeter nuts down here. As you snug them up, it should pretty much position the alternator where it needs to be and keep the pulley pretty much straight with the rest of the pulleys because if it's not and we tighten up the upper bolts first, we could get it out of position because there's a lot of slop because the holes are elongated where the two 10 millimeters go through. So we'll start with those and then we'll follow up the two tens. Now grab whatever tool you've got, and run them down. It doesn't hurt. Follow up with a ratchet. Make sure everything's nice and snug. So now we can go ahead and grab the harness that has that plastic Christmas tree fastener on it, line it up with the hole in the bracket, and push it through. You might want to add a little grease, that might help you as well. But nonetheless, we want it positioned through the bracket so that way the harness is routed properly and we don't have to worry about it rubbing up against anything metal and shorting out. So now that the alternator is bolted in place, we're now going to move on to reinstalling the throttle body. And we're going to go ahead and remove the rags that we inserted earlier to prevent anything from getting inside accidentally. And now we're going to move over to the rubber seal. Now, I told you earlier on that seal, I recommend replacing it if you're going to be taking it off. Just grab a pick or flat tip screwdriver, grab an edge and work it off. It doesn't hurt to get up in here with a rag and kind of wipe down all the grooves in case any dirt got in there. Anything that might prevent the new seal from sitting in there properly. Now if that all cleaned off, we can grab the replacement seal. This one's a different color, which doesn't make a difference. Insert it in. And make sure it's inserted all the way around the perimeter. There is a groove that it sits in. That's what holds it in place. Now that we've got that in place, now we can actually grab the throttle body. Now on the side of the throttle body that mates up against the intake and that rubber seal, we need to make sure we clean the surface. And we're not going to be using anything abrasive. Because remember, it's a rubber seal. We're not fighting with old dried up RTV or a gasket that's stuck in place. Just some brake cleaner, even some of that throttle body cleaner we use, and a rag will be more than enough to clean the surface. Once you've done that, you can rotate it in place. You want to line the two lower studs with these two holes here. Push it up against the intake. Grab your two studded eight millimeter bolts and start threading them on. Go by hand. If you go all the way with one of them, you'll be able to let go of the unit. And then you have all your hands free. 
And then once you're done with the two eight millimeter studded bolts, you can grab the two 10 millimeter nuts and place them on the studs at the bottom. Now I'm not gonna tighten these down with an impact or air tool either. I'm gonna run them down by hand and I'm gonna finish it up with a hand ratchet. Just gonna snug them down. No particular torque, just snug it down. You don't have to overdo it. it doesn't take much. If you do it by hand, you can kind of control the tightness. It's one thing when you take it off to save some time, but when you go back, you actually are saving time by doing it by hand in case you break something, and then you gotta go back and try to replace something and take everything back apart. There we have it, throttle body's back in place. Now we can deal with the connectors on both sides. So grab either one of the connectors that we removed earlier, slide it on, make sure you hear the audible click, and then slide that secondary red lock in place so that it cannot come off. Then grab the opposite connector and do the same thing. Audible click, secondary lock, and it doesn't hurt to give it a nice little tug to make sure everything is properly seated. So at this point, alternator's on, throttle body's bolted in place. We're now gonna move on to installing the serpentine belt, and then from there, we'll reposition the coolant bottle and then put the rubber inlet back on the air filter and the throttle body, and at that point, we're ready to hook the negative cable up and go ahead and start the vehicle and make sure it charges. So for now, serpentine belt. Now one of the important things you wanna do before you go installing the serpentine belt is you wanna make sure it's the same length as the one you took off. Because mind you, you're relying on the counter person at the local parts store whether or not they looked it up correctly or if it's even packaged correctly. So I want to show you a way you can figure that out. So grab one of the belts, put your foot on top, then grab the other one, do the exact same thing, keep them in line with each other, and then pull up and take the slack out. And then once you've got it all the way up, you'll see that if there's any extra around, if one's longer than the other. In this case, they look to be identical. So that's one way you can find out real quick and easy. Now that you've verified that the belt is the proper length, we need to go ahead and either grab that diagram that we drew the belt routing on, or our phone that we took pictures with, and we're gonna use that when we go to reinstall the belt. So go ahead and grab the belt, slide it over the backside of the pulley, Kind of line it up flat with the block and just kind of work it back. Once we get it over, we can go ahead and position it. Because we're going to do this twice, because the belt at one point goes from the smooth pulley down to the AC compressor, which of course is behind the pulley on the tensioner. And also it goes around the crankshaft, around the smooth side of the pulley to the AC compressor. So it's doing it twice. So once we've got it on, we'll go ahead and start positioning around some of the pulleys and then we get ready for the second time around for the crankshaft. Work it around that idler, around the alternator, around that idler. And we're getting close to working our way around the power steering pump. After that, we'll come back around to this one. And then the water pump. So we're getting a little bit closer. We've got a lot of the pulleys already taken care of. Make sure we're not any uh, on any of the studs like up around the power steering pump. So double check everything as you're going around. Make sure everything's in the grooves. Now we're gonna go around the crankshaft. Now we're gonna get ready to go ahead and go back through the tensioner pulley one more time so that we can start putting around the AC compressor. Now, of course, we're going to take the belt off a couple of pulleys as we're starting to uh, relieve the tension and getting it in place. But for now, we're going to get the basic routing of the belt to where we need it. So I can go ahead and insert that tool that I used earlier for relieving the tension or that half inch drive ratchet or breaker bar, whatever you're using. Insert it in and then we're going to go clockwise. Now we're going to start working it on all the pulleys that we took it off of so that we had a little more access. Make sure everything's still lined up, everything's in position, in all the grooves, and if we're sure, we can go ahead and start backing off. 
Now we're going to double check it one more time. So now we're ready to grab that coolant bottle. Start positioning it in place. Remember I was telling you that the overflow hose sits inside the top of the radiator, right between the creases of the aluminum seams. We're going to put the finger on the bottle into the slot on the fan shroud, sit it in place, and now we're going to line up the two holes, insert the two 8mm bolts. Now we can snug them down. And now we're ready to install the air inlet from the throttle body to the air filter box. Now it doesn't hurt to add a little bit of lube or wheel bearing grease to the inner lip just so that they slide on easier if you want. And we're going to start over here at the air inlet, make sure it's fully seated. And then we're going to move over to the throttle body and make sure it's all the way around it. And we're going to push up and make sure it's flat. We want to make sure that it doesn't get buckled underneath. Everything's positioned correctly. Now we can go back and tighten these up by hand, either using a flat tip screwdriver or an eight millimeter socket. I don't want to use any kind of impact or air power tools because I don't want to overstretch the clamps. There's a tendency they may want to break if they got some age on it, so tighten them down by hand. And now we're ready to install that plastic section of pipe that goes from the valve cover to the air inlet. We've already replaced this section of rubber hose that had the cracks in it. So now it's just a matter of sliding it down until it snaps in place. And then slide it over the nipple on the air inlet until it snaps in place. Give it a gentle tug to make sure that they're firmly seated. So now we can go ahead and grab that negative cable, put it back on the battery, tighten it down. Now we can go ahead and install the beauty cover that we took off earlier. Main thing is we gotta line it on the studs up front. Sit it down on the studs in the rear. Make sure it's fully seated. So just like any other repair, you wanna make sure that you fix the concern. So in this case, we wanna make sure that it's charging. So now you know what's involved if you ever have to replace the alternator on a Ford Mustang 2005 to 2009 with a 4.6 liter V8 engine. And don't forget some of the tips we showed you actually apply to other vehicles as well. So if you like the video, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up on YouTube. Don't forget you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you got any comments or suggestions about anything you saw in today's video or anything Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram related, you can always email me at david at motorcitymechanic.com. Also, if you like to shop on Amazon, please make sure to use the link that's in the description below this video, and any purchases that you make will help support this channel. Once again, everybody, thanks for watching.